So it was the spring of 1996, and I was sitting in the office of Mrs. Clune. Mrs. Clune was my guidance counselor in high school, and I was getting ready to graduate that spring. Mrs. Clune had some questions for me, some concerns, really. I had just decided to forego a scholarship to Purdue University, and instead, that next fall, I was going to enroll in Bible college. Mrs. Clune was not a fan of that decision. Told me that she was concerned I was wasting my potential. Told me that she was concerned that I was wasting my talent. What a strange thing to say to a 17-year-old kid. You're wasting your talent. What comes to your mind when you hear the word talent? A lot of us, when we hear the word talent, we think of something innate, something that we're born with, something that you can either develop on one hand or you can squander on the other. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what you choose to do with your talents, it's up to you because your talent, you see, is your own. But that's not actually the history of this word, talent. The English word talent actually comes from our parable this morning that you just had read to you. In the, in the version of the parable that you have read, it was, uh, I think, translated bags of silver. Oh, here we go again. Stuart, everyone. Say hello to Stuart. I think I'm, I think I'm the problem, actually. Um, so in the version of the parable that you heard read this morning, I think it was translated as bags of gold or bags of silver. But in the original version, it's actually talent is the word. And a talent was just a, a it was a word that referred to a, the, a heavy weight of something, specifically a heavy weight of gold or of wealth. A talent was, most people think, it was about the equivalent of what one person could carry on their own. So in other words, a talent was a significant treasure. It was a significant amount of wealth, a significant amount of money. But the point is that the talent, this weight, it was not your own. It didn't naturally belong to you. A talent was something that you were entrusted with to put to good use. Now, eventually, this word talent wasn't just applied to wealth, material wealth. It also came to be applied to other skills and abilities. So one person over here might have a talent of wealth, but it also applied to other skills and abilities. Another, uh, another person might have a talent of intellect, of learning. Another, another person over here might have a talent of, of art, music, painting, etc. Everyone had their own talents. But regardless of the specific nature of your talent, the point was, it was important for you to put it to good use because it didn't ultimately belong to you. The first thing I need you to know this morning is just this. There is no such thing, there's no such thing as a natural talent. There is no such thing as being naturally smart, naturally musical, naturally athletic, naturally a public speaker, etc. Because every talent that we have, every talent that you have, is ultimately a gift entrusted to you. 
Now, Mrs. Clune was right about one thing when we met. She recognized that the talents that we have are precious. These things are valuable, and they are things that we shouldn't waste. She was right about that. What we disagreed on, what I disagreed with Mrs. Clune about, was that she thought, she believed, that the best use of a talent was when it was used to serve yourself. So I had just taken uh, what, what was called a career aptitude test. Have you taken a career aptitude test? You know what I'm talking about? Um, so this was a test that, um, at least when I was in high school, that we, we all took. And it was designed to kind of uh, tell you, as if you can learn these things by taking a test, uh, but it was designed to sort of tell you what career you should pursue, what career you should choose. Because, again, we just assume that young people are like computer programs. Um, so it's just, it's just as simple as taking a test. And so the results of this career aptitude test were uh, you, you got two scores, two numbers. The first score was on earning potential. In other words, how much money could you make with a particular career? And the second score was something called social prestige, or what that means is how much respect and status could you have in society with choosing a particular career. And the way that it worked is you took the test, and you were supposed to, it's very easy, you were supposed to choose whatever career gave you the highest earning potential and the highest social status. In other words, you were supposed to choose a career to invest your talents in things that amplified yourself. That was the best use of your talent. And listen, that, that wisdom makes perfect sense to the world. Your talents, after all, are your own, and you use them best when you are using them for yourself. That wisdom makes perfect sense to the world, but that is not the wisdom of the kingdom of heaven. The parable that you've heard read this morning occurs in Matthew 25. In the very next chapter, this is towards the very end of Matthew's gospel, in the very next chapter, the plot to arrest Jesus begins to unfold. And so there's an intensity, there's an urgency to the parables in Matthew 25. There are three parables. This is the second one in Matthew 25. And each one is a very urgent message about being prepared Prepared for the return of Jesus. This is, like I said, the second of these three parables about being prepared. And each one of these parables makes us uncomfortable. Each one of these parables makes us squirm a little bit. This parable is about a wealthy man who's going away on a journey. And while he is gone, he entrusts his wealth to three of his servants. To one of his servants, he gives five talents of wealth. To another servant, he gives two. And to a third, he gives one. The first two servants put this wealth to great use. They invest it. They invest it well. And actually, their investment doubles. They double the, their, their wealth as the master is gone. The third servant chose to do nothing with what he had been given. Instead, out of fear, he hides the treasure away. And in the end, the first two servants, they are blessed, and the third servant is judged. So what's the point of the parable? Well, I think one of the points is that God has entrusted each one of us with blessings, with talents, and he expects that we would boldly invest these talents, whatever we've been given, that we would boldly invest these things in his kingdom. Now listen, I, I get it. It's easy to hear this parable, and maybe some of you had this reaction this morning when you heard it. It's easy to hear this parable and think, oh my, that's harsh. That's, that's a tough, I mean, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, that's a tough parable. That's a tough message. And I think to that, Jesus would respond like, yep. You see, Jesus wants us to take this seriously. A lot of us, listen, listen, a lot of us, we believe in God. 
Like we acknowledge that God exists. We believe that God exists. But we struggle with believing that he is real. And there's a difference between the two. So we believe that God exists, but we don't really take him seriously as a presence in our lives. We don't really take God seriously in terms of what he might be asking or demanding of our lives. So yeah, we give lip service. Say, yeah, yeah, I believe in God. I even sing wor- songs of worship to God. But is he, are you taking him seriously? Do you actually believe that God is real? Do you believe that the demands of Jesus are real? That's, that's really what we're confronted with in this parable. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit harsh, but I think Jesus wants us to take it seriously. So talking to Mrs. Clune, <laughs> I came to this kind of discovery in my life. I, I'll give you a little bit of my story that led up to this. See, what happened um, at the very end of my junior year was... Um, a tragedy in our family. We lost my older sister in a car accident. Um, and uh, I was a 17-year-old kid for the first time in my life confronted with the realities of life and death. Confronted with the realities that the things that we do in this world, the things that we invest our lives in so often, these are things that will not last Jesus talks about storing up treasures on earth where thieves break in and steal, where rust, where rust breaks down and destroys. And I was doing a lot of that. I was, I was following Jesus. I was a good church kid, whatever that means. But it wasn't really real in my life. And so when my sister's accident happened... It really, I mean, it had a lot of effect, different effects on me, but one of the things that happened was it woke me up from my slumber. And I realized that this God thing that I had just been playing with, that it actually mattered. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to invest my life in things that mattered for eternity. And that led me to it led me to make a different decision with the direction of my life. What I realized in that moment is that I had put, I had put this caution tape up around certain areas of my life. I had said about certain areas of my life, God, I believe in you. Jesus, I want to follow you. But Jesus, you are not allowed on the other side of this caution tape. You see, because there are some things in my life that are just, they're just my own. So my career, my education, that's, you got to understand, Jesus, that's for me. So Jesus, you don't belong there. For other people, it might be something different. For other people, it might be, hey, you know what? I love, I love playing sports. I've been gifted to play sports. And you know what? I follow Jesus in, other, in every other area of my life, but when it comes to my athletic pursuits, my athletic goals, Jesus, no, 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 you need to stay, you need to stay out of that area. What we do so often in our lives is we identify those things in our lives, those things that we are, quote, talented in, gifted in. And we say of those things, Jesus, you can have it all, but these things, no, 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 you're not allowed to, you're not allowed on the other side. Guys, this is not an advertisement, despite what you might think, this is not an advertisement for Bible college. (laughs) Although some of you really do need to consider Bible college, I think. I will never ever, ever apologize for calling young people to consider serving Jesus with their life vocationally. Lord knows we need more people dedicated full time to telling other people about Jesus. I'll never apologize for calling people to ministry. But what this is a call to, it's a a call to self-examination. Some of you, some of you, you you need to go to Purdue and get that engineering degree. 
Some of you, you need to become school teachers. You need to become nurses. You need to become however God has gifted you, however God has positioned you. You need to pursue that path. But here's the question. As you're pursuing that path, are you keeping God, are you keeping Jesus on the other side of the caution tape? Whatever God is calling you to, However God has positioned you, whatever God has given you, your talents, your abilities, everyone in this room, you're young, you're energetic, you realize that's a gift too. Everything that God has given you, here's the question, are you using those things in the service of the kingdom? Or are you using those things only in the service of yourself? And one of, the, one of the things that this parable teaches us is this, that when we trust God, when we put those talents to work, there is no risk. When we decide in our lives, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. I'm going to be dedicated to Jesus no matter what. I'm not going to put up any of this. T- I'm going I'm to make my whole life available to him. When we do that, there is no risk. God will use that and God will multiply that if we are willing to trust him. Let's pray. God, we uh, pray right now that you would give us um, the boldness and the faith to allow you to have full reign over our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, but heart could fathom such boundless grace. God of ages, step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Amen. The cross has spoken. I am. His own beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living. Let's lift it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death hasn't lost its grip on me. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Then came the morning, 
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me came the morning that sealed the promise 